My name is Angie Atkinson, and on this channel, I offer free daily video coaching to help you discover, understand, and overcome narcissistic abuse in toxic relationships. I like to call it toxic relationship rehab. So if that sounds good to you, hit that subscribe button and we will just get going. While I'm here, I'm just going to really quickly remind you about something important. One of the most common roadblocks to creating personal change in our lives and to starting that new, better life for ourselves, the healthier life, it's fear. And that's because when things change in our lives, well, it ushers in these differences that make us scared. We're scared of the unknown. We're scared of what might happen. When it comes to leaving a narcissist and beginning to recover from the abuse that you suffered, you know, we, we worry about being alone. We worry about financial ruin. We worry about fear of change. It's all common roadblocks we all deal with as we're considering our options. So I like the, uh, I think it's called an anagram of fear, um, false evidence appearing real. I think it's a really good way to see things because the fact is that your fears are usually based on what if, right? And, and a lot of times those things don't even come to pass. So don't let fear cause you to sit on your sidelines of, of your life and not do anything. Um, and another roadblock, of course, that gets in the way is just a simple lack of knowledge. So make sure that you know what you're going to do. Make a plan. Go to queenbeing.com slash plan if you're going to leave and, and check that out. Really plan ahead if you can, um, because you might be branching out into an area that's outside of your scope and you just need to learn some new things. Remember that what you don't know can always be learned and that you can use educational resources as a catalyst for change. And that's important. That's part of what I'm doing here right now. So just Remember that you don't have to settle for abuse. You don't have to settle for good enough or tolerable. You really can have the life that you want. So one of my favorite quotes in the whole wide world is, I am fearless, therefore I am powerful. And it's actually from a Mary Shelley book, Frankenstein. You guys might have heard of that. I know one of the things that we struggle with so much as we go through narcissistic abuse recovery and just life in general is fear. What do they say about fear? It's false evidence appearing real, right? So I think that if we can all learn to get past our fear, we're going to all be a lot better for it. I know that there have been so many things in my life where I have personally been scared to death. Jihan is back in the house. Good morning. She says, what is your most magical healing tip? Well, I'll tell you what, my most magical healing tip is that it's all in your head. And what I mean by that is you really do get to decide how to feel. You really do get to decide how to react, how to respond, and you get to decide what you focus on. Your perception, my friend, it changes your entire life, okay? So if you are in a position to feel miserable today, then change your mind. That's it. Choose how to feel. Choose to be happy. So what is fear setting for ultimate self-reliance? Well, self-reliance means having the will and the courage to do things alone rather than relying on other people. This is very powerful because it means that you can never feel completely alone or lost. You are the one person who will always be with you and if that is enough, well, then it's gonna make a big difference and put you in a much stronger position. If you're self-reliant, then there's nothing that can be taken away from you. That's gonna leave you completely destroyed. As I mentioned, true self-reliance takes courage. The ability to be alone, to take risks without a safety net and to cut ties when it best serves your interest is one that requires a certain fearlessness that not everyone possesses naturally. So for many people, the first step towards self-reliance is in acquiring that change, that courage that makes everything else possible. And one tool for doing this is fear setting. Well, what's fear setting? It's an idea that was made popular by Tim Ferriss, who wrote the book for our work week. It's a concept that really takes its cues from an aspect of cognitive behavior, behavioral therapy known as thought challenging. So for most of us, our fears come from beliefs we hold about things that could go wrong or that might happen. Well, in the case of self-reliance, we might be afraid that everyone's going to leave us and we're going to go crazy from loneliness. Or maybe we worry that if we cut our ties with our current career, that we'll end up with nothing to go back to. These fears are exactly what limit us from taking risks often and what prevent us from living into our full potential. They're a huge obstacle because of that. And when it comes to achieving self-reliance, 
it, fear setting is about taking these beliefs and then making them less scary. So you can do this by writing them down and then assessing how likely they really are to come to fruition. And what's more, you, you'll also come up with a contingency plans that will help you figure out how to cope if they should ever really happen. So for example, if you're worried that you might end up without your job if you take time off, well then fear setting could be the process of thinking about, well, how would I cope with that? Would you be destitute? Would you just lose everything? Or could it be that you would be relatively able to find work. Do you have enough savings to survive a few weeks? Use fear setting and your fears don't seem so big and that's how you gain the courage to be fully self-reliant. Feel me? We should all be fearless. Look what we've faced and been through. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Every situation is different. You want to start taking steps toward changing your life one thing at a time. Change your perspective first and then start to work toward your goals. Look, we've all been so scared in our lifetimes, I think. And uh, to be honest with you, I think we have to overcome fear every single day. But, you know, my 13-year-old says, you know what I do when I'm scared of something? I suck it up and I do it anyway, and I, and I never regret it, you know? So if you're working towards something that you truly want and you're afraid, just push through it and do it anyway. I am fearless, therefore I am powerful. I mean, that is just, to me, Oh my gosh, that, that's the crux of it all. Be fearless because it makes you powerful. You know what I'm saying? This is how you build the courage to leave your abuser. When you're in an abusive relationship, it can be difficult to see the way out. But you don't have to be trapped in a relationship with an abusive partner. Separate yourself from your abuser safely with these strategies. Understand why you stay. You really can't gain the courage to leave until you understand why you're staying. What's keeping you from leaving? Are you staying out of fear? Do you think you deserve to be punished? Are you worried you can't find someone better? The abuse makes you think it's your fault, but it isn't. Maybe you think you can fix the issues or that if you love your partner enough, they will stop being abusive. Get fierce, build up your confidence and your self-esteem to gain courage to leave the abuser if you're still there. You can start by acknowledging that your self-esteem does need work, thanks to the abuse, and you can also consider the causes of your low self-esteem. Did you feel not good enough a lot? Once you have the answers, you can work to resolve your feelings about your past. You can put the past in the past and you can ensure that those negative feelings don't affect who you are today. To build your self-esteem, do a nice thing for yourself every single day. Pay attention to what others say about you that is positive. Journal about it or take notes so that you always have a reminder of your positive aspects. Get outside help from family, friends, or other people in your life. Maybe a coach or a therapist. Just ask someone for help. It doesn't make you weak. Develop the courage and a plan to leave. There may also be community resources, nonprofits, and organizations that can help. Are you scared to leave your partner because you're financially dependent on them? It's easier to leave with money, so set some aside that your abuser doesn't have access to, or ask friends and family to help. Don't stay with an abusive partner out of fear. Figure out a way to escape, even if you need help. Get started on a healthier life today. When you're finished healing, my friend, you're gonna be the strongest person you know in real life. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. You know how it feels when you're in a room full of people and yet you feel completely alone? This is exactly what many survivors of narcissistic abuse say they experience and I've been there myself. After finally realizing what I'd been dealing with for so long, because of the shame and the fear, the guilt, the embarrassment, all of this of being tortured by a narcissist, a lot of victims won't even talk about it with the people that they're closest to in their lives. And even when they appear to be totally fine and are capable of a friendly conversation and have good social skills, there can be an underlying feeling of isolation for a survivor, one that feels a lot like a dull ache. So often, I hear this from my clients, they feel like they don't even know how to be vulnerable anymore. And they find themselves feeling very gun shy, constantly on alert. Emotional abuse, as well as physical and deeper forms of psychological abuse like gaslighting, they teach us to shut up, to stop talking about ourselves. We become paralyzed in certain ways. One of those is developing the need to be alone. Let's talk about that for a minute, shall we? 
why do survivors of narcissistic abuse have so much trouble feeling really connected to people? Why do we so often find the need to be alone after any sort of social interaction? Why do we find the idea of certain kinds of interactions just incredibly overwhelming to the point that we just become paralyzed and hide inside these little cocoons we create for ourselves? Well, we're going to start answering those questions by looking at our situations from an intellectual standpoint. Emotions aside, we're in a very uncomfortable position when we're dealing with a narcissist in our daily lives. We're taught that everything we think and believe is just wrong, or at the very least, no one validates us and we begin to believe the lies the narcissist tells us about ourselves. And in most cases, these situations are created without our consent, whether we're, we've been fooled into becoming enmeshed with them or we were born into it. You're going to feel abandoned, my friend. You're going to feel lonely sometimes. And at the same time, you're going to want to be alone all the time. Overwhelming would be an understatement because if we're being honest with ourselves, we are in an almost suspended state. Whether we're still stuck in the toxic relationship and or we've moved on and, and we're going through narcissistic abuse recovery. Narcissists do not provide closure. They stalk us. They cajole, beg, promise, persuade, and ultimately succeed in doing the impossible one more time. They sweep us off our feet, and even though we know better than to succumb to these superficial charms, we do. We go back to the relationship. We hope for a better ending this time. We walk on eggshells. We become the epitome of submissiveness, a perfect source of narcissistic supply. We become their ideal mate, spouse, partner, colleague, child. We keep our fingers crossed. But how does the narcissist react to the resurrection of the bond? Well, that depends on whether you've re-entered the relationship from a position of strength or one of vulnerability and weakness. The narcissist casts all interactions with other people in terms of conflicts or competitions they can win. You're not a partner. You're more like an adversary, someone to be subjugated and defeated. And as far as a narcissist is concerned, you, when you return to the fold, it's a triumph. It's a win for them, proof of their superiority, their irresistibility. And God forbid you're perceived as autonomous dangerously independent or capable of bailing out and abandoning them because then the narcissist acts like they're amazing. They're part of the loving, sensitive, compassionate, empathic. It's crazy. Narcissists respect strength and they're awed by it. So as long as you can maintain a no-nonsense attitude, putting them on probation, well, they might behave. But of course, if you've resumed contact because they've threatened you or because you're dependent on them financially, emotionally, or otherwise, they're going to pounce on that and they're going to exploit your fragility in order to get what they want. Following a perfunctory honeymoon, the narcissist is immediately going to start controlling and abusing you. And in both cases, the narcissist's reserves are exhausted and their true nature and their feelings emerge. The facade crumbles and beneath it, guess what? The same old heartless falsity that we call a narcissist. The gleeful smugness at having bent you to their wishes and their rules. The all-consuming sense of entitlement. The sexual depravity. Aggression. Pathological envy. Rage. All erupt uncontrollably. And it is worse if it follows a lengthy separation where you've made a life for yourself. With your own interests, pursuits, friends, needs, wishes, plans, and obligations, independent of your narcissist. The narcissist cannot handle your separateness. You're a mere instrument of gratification or an extension of the narcissist's bloated false self. The narcissist becomes insanely jealous of your friends, refuses to accept your preferences or compromise his or her own, and they're envious and dismissive of your accomplishments. My gosh, the fact that you have survived without the narcissist seems to deny them their little narcissistic supply. Then the inevitable cycle of idealization and devaluation begins. The narcissist berates you, humiliates you publicly, threatens you, destabilizes you by becoming unpredictable, fosters ambient abuse, and uses others to humiliate you. Ab abuse by proxy. Then you're faced with a tough choice. Leave again 
give up the emotional and financial investments that you made in order to attempt to resurrect this relationship? Or go on trying, subject to daily abuse and worse. Look, you've been here before. But this time, it's the familiarity, it doesn't make it any less nightmarish. As we seek to get closure, we have to accept the truth of what we've experienced, and it's more complicated than it sounds. The confusion, anger, love bombing, abuse cycle spinning, we were seduced into becoming narcissistic supply. If the narcissist in our lives is our spouse or our partner, we were seduced with promises of having someone on our side or a soulmate or whatever that looks like for us. We were brought in thinking we were getting happiness. If our parent was the person who was a narcissist in our lives, well, it looked more like I'm really the only person who actually loves you. So if you don't do exactly what I want, you are going to be completely alone in this world. In either case, it doesn't look good. It looks like if you don't do what I want, you will be alone. The narcissist knows instinctively that everyone is secretly afraid, at least on some level, of ending up completely alone and unloved, whether they admit it or not. The narcissist is also incredibly afraid of that, and it's why you don't often see a narcissist stay single for very long. They inevitably tend to grab hold of one branch before they let go of the last one. And just to avoid confusion here, most narcissists will secure a new supply before they let go of you. That's what I mean. They often run parallel relationships just to avoid being alone. That's part of the reason you might be dealing with jealousy in a relationship with one, even if you don't realize it. Your narcissist might exhibit extreme jealousy when other potential suitors are near you or involved in your life. Whether you'd really go there or not is not really an issue for them. If they feel threatened, the jealousy comes out. Often, it's a projection of their own indiscretions. They're cheating on you or considering it, so they become hypervigilant. Ironically, the narc will scream at you, say you're insane, or otherwise invalidate you if you ask about other people in their lives. You end up dealing with the sickening feelings of betrayal all by yourself, wondering if the narcissist is right that maybe you really are crazy. Hint, you're probably not. You're called jealous or crazy or whatever because, you know, they tell you you're making up things in your head and stuff like that. But you have to remember that listening to your gut means tuning into your intuition, to your divine self, your divine connection to your higher power or the universe or God, whatever you call it. Don't ignore it. Trust yourself when you feel something strongly. Why does this make you want to be alone all the time, though? Well, it starts with the fact that you're likely an empath like me. You have the ability to really feel what everybody else around you is feeling, especially with someone you spend a lot of time with or someone you love. The narcissist overwhelms you with the pressure of being responsible for their emotions. You're always spinning, trying to fix them. And it's freaking exhausting. While you're still in it, you probably find yourself sort of saving up your energy. You don't want to talk to people about anything serious and you can't handle one more straw on the proverbial camel's back. So you begin to isolate yourself in order to sort of recharge between your sessions of abuse with the narcissist. Once you're out, you might continue to isolate yourself out of habit or out of a need to protect yourself from the world. Even though you feel lonely sometimes, you might choose to stay alone just for the peace of it. Who could blame you? When you try to change the situation, you feel paralyzed, you feel overwhelmed, you've forgotten how to even be normal anymore, whatever that means. You prefer to avoid any intimate connections, sometimes in order to protect your heart. Even if your narcissist was your parent, this can be the case. Being with a narcissist, it causes you to distrust yourself, but also the whole world around you. How do you change that? Well, first you admit that you were or are in a codependent relationship and you acknowledge the mental and emotional abuse and manipulation in order to begin to understand why it happened. While you played a role in that relationship, you have to realize that it's really not your fault that it happened. You really got pulled into it under false pretenses. You have the option and the right to change this whole deal. And yes, this even applies when family is involved. You have the right to feel peace. You have the right to determine who you are 
the opportunity to decide what happens from here on out, and the responsibility to change your life for the better. It's my mission to teach others what I know to be true. You really can create the life you want. Take care of your body. Take care of your soul. Nurture the real you and introduce him or her to the world. Be comfortable in your own skin and in your place in this world. Take your spot. Take it now. And the universe will take its cue from you. You feel me? If so, subscribe to my channel. Let's get it done together.